Good morning everybody, welcome to Fever FM. This morning we have Richard Bergen, our local MP, and we've got some questions for him. Good morning Richard. Hi Julian, how are you doing? It's nice and bracing this morning, isn't it? It's very bracing. Right, it's been a very eventful 2020 for us all, no less than you. With your role having changed from being the shadow cabinet, how do you see your role as MP for East Leeds in supporting constituents during these unprecedented times? Well, it's been a very difficult time for everyone here in our community and that's why I've been holding extra advice sessions throughout this crisis. But of course at the moment I'm holding all my advice sessions by telephone rather than in person because usually when I hold my advice sessions I hold them in community centres but obviously it wouldn't be safe for people to be queuing up uh, and sitting together because sometimes we have on a Saturday maybe, on a Friday and Saturday normally, uh, in, a, in a community centre, uh, I'd see maybe 50 people across my uh, advice sessions. So we're doing them now by telephone instead. And there's even more people than usual needing help because both in terms of the public health crisis and the economic crisis, people here in East Leeds are facing incredibly tough times. Just look at universal credits, uh, for example. Uh, almost 7,000 people here in East Leeds are in receipt of universal credits and the increase in the number of people in universal credit in East Leeds during this crisis is greater than the total number of people on universal credit in the neighbouring constituency of Elmet and Rothwell. So that shows the kind of economic pressure people are under here in our community. Yeah, yeah, of course. And what do you think the most important thing for government to be focused on today regarding the COVID-19? and? Do you think another lockdown was the right answer? I think the government's made a mess of this uh, throughout, which is why we've got one of the highest uh, death tolls uh, in the world, or death rates uh, in the world. They've made a real mess of this. I think what they should have done is learn from other governments in other countries that have handled this far better. Look at New Zealand, for example, or South Korea. In New Zealand, a few weeks ago I was watching footage of packed rugby stadiums but people safely packed into the rugby stadiums because they'd managed to get the rates of coronavirus to such a low level that the virus was in effect eliminated and they could then turn to the position of locking down cases, not locking down the country, of locking down cases, not locking down uh, the uh, economy. But what we had in this country was the government delayed too long in bringing the lockdown in back in March. It then ended the lockdown too early. And then when the virus had got to a, a much lower level in the summer, instead of using that in order to get test, track and trace uh, sorted out, they instead told people it was their patriotic duty to go to the pub, go out and spend money, and actually that meant the virus levels went up. So the restrictions are necessary, restrictions are necessary, but if the government had handled this correctly, we would be in a situation where we'd be far further on in moving back more towards a normal life. Obviously, the vaccine, uh, the progress in the vaccine is good news, it's light at the end of the tunnel, but we need to get the virus down to low levels. So I think the two key tests for the government are saving lives and saving livelihoods. And I'm afraid on both counts they've failed. We've got one of the highest death rates. And in terms of saving livelihoods, so many self-employed people are being left out. So many contractors are being left out. So many small businesses haven't been provided with the support uh, they need. Um, and the other thing is, look at our sick pay. Sick pay in this country is an abysmally low level. Sick pay should be a real living wage level because if, you, if the government wants people to isolate, to stop the spread of the virus, they need to be able to afford to do so. And that's why I've been campaigning for the government to raise sick pay to real living wage levels so people can afford to self-isolate. Yeah, OK. Um, I think a big issue with the pandemic is mental health, station and loneliness and have you got anything planned for offering people support for their mental well-being during this pandemic? Well, I've just put down an early day motion, uh, which is actually about closing online suicide forums, which is an important issue. But in relation to the issue you raised, the early day motion that I've put down, which has been backed by 52 members of parliament, also includes a call for the government to increase mental health funding. Because as you say, people's mental health 
uh, is much more at risk even than normal with all the isolation, with people's uncertainty when it comes to employment and obviously the fear of the virus as well, uh, the loss of loved ones and the fear of loss of loved ones. So we really do need to put mental health at the centre uh, of the approach when it comes to public health. Yeah, I think pertinent to this area, the death rate from COVID-19 among Asian BAME people is far higher than the average. Why do you think this is and what is being done to protect the Asian BAME constituents? Well, it's an absolute scandal that uh, the death rate uh, and the coronavirus rate is so much disproportionately higher uh, for the uh, black and minority ethnic communities and the Asian uh, community. I've supported calls for there to be an inquiry into uh, the effect of this crisis on BAME communities. What's happened is that the divisions in our society, the inequalities in our society have had a light shone upon them and they've been exacerbated by this crisis. So I think one of the reasons that uh, black and minority ethnic communities have suffered more from coronavirus is a greater disproportionality of people in those communities are in low paid public facing jobs, are in overcrowded uh, private uh, housing uh, and are working for example in shops or in public transport and so in those working class jobs they've been more at risk of getting coronavirus and that just goes to show what an unequal society we live in and that needs to change. Yeah and also many of our listeners are self-employed and struggling to get by what support are you proposing to put in place to protect the relatively low-paid self-employed people of this area? Well, I think that self-employed people have been um, neglected by the government when it comes to uh, their support. Uh, many people are falling uh, through the loopholes, really, or falling... Um, falling through the net when it comes to government support. I think taxi drivers need more support. I've written to the government about that. Uh, I think that taxi drivers uh, should have had more support through this because obviously many taxi drivers are self-employed, but obviously as well, even the taxi drivers that are working, there's far less work for them, so their income has really suffered. So I don't think the government's done enough to support uh, taxi drivers and other self-employed people in our community. What would Labour have done differently to the Conservative Party regarding any of these issues that we've talked about? Well, what the Labour Party called for, for example, the Labour Party leadership called for a circuit breaker lockdown back in October. The government dismissed this as a silly idea, they dismissed it as a ludicrous idea, and then they did something like that but a few weeks later and so they ignored the scientists they ignored the call from the Labour leadership was based upon what the scientists were saying but also uh, the Labour Party uh, would have put more financial support uh, in place in terms of our communities but MPs like myself from the start have been calling although this isn't the Labour Party's um, formal policy uh, Labour Party MPs such as myself have been calling for an explicit zero Covid strategy as uh, pursued in, uh, in New Zealand, as um, pursued in South Korea and elsewhere, uh, because they've been able to return to more normal lives much more quickly than we've been able to do, because they got the virus to those uh, low levels so it could be uh, managed so that cases could be locked down, not the whole country being locked down. So that cases could be locked down, the economy needn't be locked down. And actually, that's helped to get the economies in those countries up and running again. So the approach that the government's taken hasn't met the test of saving lives properly, hasn't met the test of saving livelihoods properly. But the key thing, the key test now is who's going to pay the price for this crisis. Boris Johnson's made clear that he's going to make the price of this crisis paid for on the backs of the working class. That's why we've seen broken promises in terms of increases in the national minimum wage. That's why we've seen a miserly 37 pence increase uh, in benefit uh, rates. That's why we've seen real term uh, pay decreases uh, in many public sector jobs. And that's why yesterday at Prime Minister's Question Time, I asked Boris, Boris Johnson to agree to introduce a windfall tax on the super wealthy. There are big companies who have actually hugely increased their profits as a result of this crisis. It's only fair that they therefore pay their way when it comes to helping the whole community to get back to work and to move out of this crisis. 
You won't be surprised to know that Boris Johnson poured scorn on my idea. He rejected my proposal for a windfall tax, but it is something that should be done. I've seen they've done something similar uh, in Argentina, for example. Yeah, OK. And today and going forward, what would your advice be for your constituents regarding the pandemic? Well, my advice to my constituents uh, is to stay safe, look out for each other, look after uh, each other and know that hopefully next year we can start to move towards a better future all of us together. People here in East Leeds have done an incredible job supporting each other. Here in Harehills, for example, community groups, religious organisations, neighbours looking out for each other, looking after each other, showing the true spirit of community. And I think this awful pandemic in some ways, although it's shown the dreadful inequalities in our society, although it's exacerbated the inequalities in our society, also within this awful period, we've also seen the best of people here in our community. So I hope that when we come out of this, that we'll all be closer together, that we'll all be closer to our neighbours, that we'll all be closer to the rest of our communities. So my actual message to people here in Hare Hills and to people listening and watching, is thank you. Thank you for keeping each other safe. Thank you for, thank you for looking after each other. Thank you for showing. Thank you for showing that community isn't a thing of the past. Because often when people talk about community spirit, they talk about the, de the communities from decades and decades ago. I think what we've seen during this crisis with the way people have operated food banks, the way people have helped neighbours with the shopping, the way people have made phone calls and knocked on the doors of elderly, and neighbours to make sure they're okay. We've seen that community spirit is alive and well in this country and here in our community in Hare Hills and across East Leeds. Perfect, perfect. And finally, do you have anything to add? I don't have anything to add other than I'm delighted to be here at Fever FM and no one leaves Fever FM empty-handed. So Jabbar kindly gave me this mask, which I'll uh, wear with pride. And when I get to go back down to Parliament, because at the moment I'm voting remotely in Parliament via proxy vote, and I'm contributing in Parliament via a video link, when I do go back to Parliament, I'll be wearing this on the train, I'll be wearing this in Parliament, and everyone will go, is that the famous Fever FM from Hare Hills that we've heard of? And I'll say it certainly is. Listen in, listen in, and you might learn something from listening to Fever FM.